Let's begin just with the general market. You had said 2020 would be a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity or at least a once-in-every-10-years opportunity. Where are we <laughs> in that opportunity now? And, and now that the first wave of buying is over, you know, is there another wave to come this year? Um, well, one, thank you for having me. Um, it actually, uh, th there's this misconception that there's no, that we've sort of missed it. We haven't missed it. Um, yeah, the stock market is doing really well, and I think that's fabulous for the equities. But you've got a record number of companies that have already filed, and they're continuing to file. Um, it's really a world of haves and have-nots, and right now for us, um, we're finding quite a bit to do um, in the U.S. and around the world. Yeah, exactly. Mark, we'll get to all of the bits that you're doing hopefully in a moment. But first, what do you do if you feel like buying, but you know that it's probably not the time yet? Have you any forecast for us on when we're likely to see, you know, more pain? Um, I think now's a great time to buy. I mean, I, I don't think you can... you know, Intelsat being one of them. Um, you can buy into companies that are in the middle of the restructuring, and then you'll also be buying once companies file. So this is going to be a gift that just keeps on giving. You said Intelsat. Talk to us about where else you're buying. I know you were interested in Hertz and JCPenney and, and obviously areas where there are structural challenges, you know, secular challenges too. Where else are you finding opportunity? Oh, everywhere, to be honest with you. I mean, there's huge opportunities on the energy side, uh, huge opportunities on the retail. We have. We, we invested in JCPenney. We've invested in Hertz. We've invested in Macy's, uh, Frontier Communications, Intelsat. I mean, the list just goes on. I mean, we just did a deal with a company, a major airline uh, today, an airline that you would know. Um, I can't talk about it because we have a confidential, confidentiality agreement. In essence, we bought from them 13 planes, and we ended up buying those planes for about $150 million. Um, and then we leased those planes right back to the company, and we're earning 15 16 percent on those, and we own the planes. So when you sort of think about what's going on, um, what you have out there is people who need capital, and we're either providing that capital through bilateral agreements or – um, we're investing in these distressed situations or special situations right now. Well, that's actually really fascinating, Mark. But let me get to then why you are necessary. So the Fed obviously has stepped in and backstopped everything. We're looking at something like nearly $2 trillion of pricing this year alone when it comes to high-grade, investment-grade, junk, leverage loans. And still there are companies even large ones, but mainly medium and small ones that are shut out of the credit markets. And I guess that's where you come in. Is there an inequality in the credit markets that will lead to some kind of disaster down the road? No, it's not that it's, it's not an inequality. What's going on, what the Fed really did was provide liquidity for companies who had collateral. So it enabled and, and opened up the market and said, we're going to be in there, we're going to buy it. But the problem ends up being for companies who don't have excess collateral. So they had already borrowed as much as they could. You know, Hertz and Avis is actually a really good example, just because, you know, they both do the same thing. Why did Hertz file for bankruptcy and Avis didn't? The main reason is Hertz had already borrowed as much as they could. Uh, they didn't have excess collateral, whereas Avis did, and Avis could draw down on their revolver, and Hertz was fully drawn. So that's what's really happening. The Fed can't do anything about that. There's nothing the Fed can do there. So what the Fed can do is provide liquidity for companies that have collateral. Uh, but if you don't have it, there's nothing that's going to happen. That's why you're seeing and you're continuing to see bankruptcies is there's just a lot of companies that already had borrowed the max they could. So will we see another wave? I mean, obviously, you've said we will see another wave of bankruptcies. What percentage of small to medium-sized businesses survive this, Mark, when you consider that we're looking at JCPenney getting used by Amazon for fulfillment centers at this point? Yeah, and I, I think what you're going to see, it's not another wave. It's just going to keep on happening. It's going to continue and continue and continue. 
um, until things get back to normal. And normal will be when people um, can really go back out. And whether that's six months, nine months, a year, two years from now, I don't know. But what you're having is you're having the companies that sort of like an Amazon that looks at JCPenney and says, hey, we can use those 850 stores as ful fulfillment centers. We can take advantage of the issues that other companies are having because for Amazon, they're growing by leaps and bounds, and they need more warehouses. They need more space. So you're going to see that, and I think that that's what's really happening is comp you know, sort of the large companies that are able to have capital, um, they're going to do great, and the smaller companies – um, it's not like J.C. Penney was that small. It had five billion of debt, but J.C. Penney bank debt was trading at thirty-five cents on the dollar, and it had two billion of secured debt. So that's you know it valued J.C. Penney at seven hundred million, where prior to the filing, the company you know was valued at sort of had equity value, so it was valued at greater than five billion. So you've got a massive amount of these opportunities out there, and that's going to continue. Mark, high yield obviously really tightly priced. We're looking at sort of 5% relative to treasuries, which might imply yep. something like a 5% default rate. But, you know, we're either going to see much, much higher default rates than that or much lower. What's your medium term outlook? I think you're going to have default rates of between 5 and 10%. Um, it's just going to continue to grow because companies are running out of cash. If you've got access to capital, life is great. You're going to last, you know, for another two years. But if you don't have access to that capital, you know, as soon as that runs out, you're filing for bankruptcy. And I think you're just going to continue seeing that um, every week, just more and more companies filing. The energy space, Mark, so you already talked about airlines, you talked about Frontier, Intel, SAT, and you also mentioned energy. Where are you finding those kinds of opportunities in energy that might pay off down the line, obviously? Well, what's happening is, you know, on the energy side, um, there's been very little capital that's been invested in that, uh, simply because a lot of people had invested in energy and lost quite a bit of money. Um, but what you're seeing in a number of situations today is you can come in, create companies um, at sort of two to three times. Um, and as long as oil stays around sort of that $35 to $45 a barrel, you'll be fine. So for us, you know, a company we're investing in, you know, Diamond Offshore, um, it's, you know, we've been buying the bonds. Um, we're going to end up owning the equity in that company. So I think you're going to just see more and more of those types of situations. What about other areas like hotels and casinos? We saw a big investment, you know, on the part of IAC uh, or a billion dollar investment. I don't know how big IAC considers that in MGM, particularly for the online gaming. Are you looking at any of those areas? Hospitality? Um, yeah, we are. I mean, we're looking, I mean, I think on, um, you know, for the theater, on the theater side, uh, AMC, I think you can come in, you can buy that secure debt, you can create the company at two to three times. Um, look, there's, I, I think in the leisure side, on the gaming side, there is huge opportunities. I mean, there really is. It, think of it this way. Um, you know, it, look at Carnival Cruise. So Carnival Cruise um, is losing about a billion a quarter, and yet it's got about 10 to 15 billion of equity value. Um, so the market is saying that Carnival Cruise within the next year, next year and a half, is going to go back to having $5 billion of EBITDA. So if you believe that, which I, there, there's no reason not to, then that means that companies that today are having problems are going to do the same thing, same thing on the theater side, same thing on the, you know, on the gaming side, same thing on the hotel side. They just need time. So I think once – you know, you've got a, a year that's gone by, you're going to find that all these companies, you know, they may not get back to where they were in 2019, but you're going to see that it's starting to get back. So I think those investments today will be pretty good. So on the theater side, how are you choosing them? So AMC, and are you looking at others? Are you looking at other types of entertainment options too? Yeah, we are. No, we are. I, I think right now, you know, it's same thing as like on the retail You've got a number of companies that have problems, so you sort of find the ones that you think have the best at, at best asset value. So I think AMC is one of those. Um, so you're going to end up picking one or two of those companies, just like you'll do the same thing on the retail side. Um, 
you don't need to go do you know every single one on the retail. It's not a retail fund. Um, mainly what you're trying to do is just try to do all the special situations where you're getting overpaid for all this risk. What's overpaying, Mark? What are your, what are your percentages? What's the minimum you'd accept at this point? Um, oh, God. Um, I, I think the minimums, at least for what we do, is um, you know, probably $5 million. But I think in, when I say getting overpaid, um, you know, you're in a zero-rate environment. You just talked about sort of where, you know, treasuries are and the high-yield market. You know, for what we're doing, um, we think ultimately at the end of the day it's going to be, you know, you should be able to make sort of 15 to 20 percent over the course of the next couple of years uh, per year. And Mark, do you find that given the amount of you know, money that's been raised you know, for distressed opportunities and otherwise you know, private opportunities and so on, that you're actually competing or can you still set prices? Because back in March, boy, could you set prices. In March, you could set prices, but today you're still able to do really well. I, you know, I would always ask a simple question. Are people still buying stock? It seems like they are, and yet the market is making new highs or, you know, has gone through the roof over the course of the last three months. Um, for some reason, people love to time distress, but on the equity side, nobody wants to time equities. Um, I would say to you today that you can end up investing in companies where ultimately I think the returns will be in excess of 20 percent plus. So is the sign you're looking for when people stop buying equities, Mark? No, I think for me, the... Really, what it is is that right now, um, you, you've got you've got a disconnect that's going on, and that's really for us what we want. We want the disconnect where um, you're actually in a in an environment where you can take advantage of what's happening. I'm I'm not really worried whether people are buying equities or not. I sort of look at do people need capital, and I think right now people need capital. So as long as there's a need for capital, we'll be able to do well. Before we move on to the box, I do want to ask you just about your overall thoughts on where American society is headed right now in coronavirus. And obviously, not just America, but globally. Um, if bankruptcies are going to continue, you know, as you say, and the situation seems as dire as, as you point out, I mean, it's great for some investors, I guess, but where do you see society headed between now and the end of the year? Well, it's not, it's not that I think it's dire. I think what you've got is you're just having a reckoning for a number of companies that were over levered. So I think when I look at what's happening, it's actually all, you know, in one sense it's positive because um, people are looking forward to when things are back to normal. Um, it's just that some a number of companies have gotten stuck in that situation where they just don't have the capital to wait it out. If you think of 2008, you know, the fear in 2008 was that the system was going to break, that banks would go under and there would be issues. Today, there's not that fear at all. Today, the question is, when do we get back to normal? So, you know, to me, whether that happens a year or two years from now, um, you know, I think it's absolutely going to happen, and hopefully it happens sooner. But till then, you're going to have a lot of companies that just have issues. Um, but then again, you're also going to have a lot of companies that are taking advantage of that. So for companies like Amazon, Facebook, Google, um, you know, this has been the best of times. Those companies are hitting new highs. For other companies, it's not so good just simply because, you know, if you're on the leisure side, if you're on the gaming side, if you're on the restaurant side, um, there's nothing you can do, right? I mean, people aren't congregating. So that's where the issues are. It's just things have changed. And I think until things get back to normal, um, we have to deal with those issues. And I think for us, um, try to take advantage of some of those opportunities. All right. Well, talking about taking advantage, your bucks certainly are, Mark. The winning percentage is still at 57%, 275 wins to 205 losses. And next week, obviously, you're down in Orlando. But I do have to ask you about President Trump's comments this morning. He said some NBA players are, quote, nasty, very, very nasty, and frankly, dumb. So the NBA caters to uh, China, and it's a disgrace. I mean, first of all, do you have any response to the president as a co-owner? 
Look, I think the president's allowed to have his opinions. Um, I don't agree with those opinions. I think I think what we have been doing in the NBA has actually been, you know, uh, very very good. I think I think we've got a product out there. People, I think earnings, not earnings, sorry, ratings are going through the roof. So, you know, I would respectfully disagree with the president's opinion. Okay, so you're obviously going down there next week. Talk to us about the Bucks' chances. I mean, I presume you're going to say that they have a, a great chance of winning outright. Um, will that have been in part thanks to private equity? Um, well, look, I think obviously you're right. I do think we have a great chance. But part of that is um, I think Adam Silver has done a phenomenal job in making sure that everybody stays healthy and that we can actually compete. Um, one of the things you're seeing is that, you know, no players have gotten sick while they've been down there. Um, I think ultimately, you know, the playoffs start next week. I think you're going to have uh, America tuning into that. Hopefully it's also the rest of the world. But I think we have as good a chance, you know, as anybody. Obviously I'm a bit biased, so I think our chance is better. Um, so, you know, I'd like us to win a championship, and hopefully we will. Mark, you know, obviously your, your you know, valuation is your thing. Um, where are NBA team and franchise valuations right now? Like, is there, would you, would you price in a percentage discount because of coronavirus and how, you know, sports rights might go from here? Uh, maybe a premium even. Oh, no, not at all. I think actually values are higher. Yep. Um, and I think the reason the values are higher is that people have come to realization. Um, you know, one of the things you've seen during this is that um, there is a real need for sports and that people want sports. So, look, we all know things are going to get back to normal. And when they do, I think the values of all these teams, um, you know, will be even higher because for, um, for Facebook and Amazon and Google, um, I think they're going to want to end up uh, streaming those games. Um, so that's what we're seeing. We're just seeing more and more interest in uh, in the NBA and in our team. Have you had any conversations with Amazon or anybody else about streaming? Um, no, no. We have a contract right now um, with you know TNT and Disney, and that's actually been going great. I mean, we, we love our partner. I just think what you're going to find is that um, you know, over time, you're going to have even more and more interest from different groups. I want to move now to uh, Joe Biden. Obviously, you're a fundraiser on the, the National Finance Committee for Biden. We're expecting a VP nominee pick today, tomorrow, sometime midweek. Who will it be, Mark? Who would you like to see it be? Um, I think it'll be Senator Harris. You know, that's, uh, if I was Vice President Biden, that's who I would pick. I think she is, you know, ultimately at the end of the day, um, she'd be a great pick. Uh, but then again, I'm not the one picking. So if, if they want my opinion, you know, I've given it, and, you know, we'll all find out at the same time. And you're not concerned about her record as a prosecutor, record on crime or anything like that? Look, I think she ran for president. You know, she, everybody's got a record. And, you know, I think what she did, she did a fabulous job. I think the other people who are also up for vice president um, have also done a really good job. But I, I think for what Senator Harris did when she was the attorney general, um, I think she did a very good job. And she ended up um, doing what she needed to do as attorney general. So, no, I don't think it's an issue at all. Finally, Mark, what do you see happening in November and, and beyond? I mean, if it's mail-in balloting, you know, what's your outlook for how it plays out? Do we get to January without an answer? No, I don't think so. I, I, I think at the end of the day, we'll know, we'll know, you know, by the end of the night. Um, you know, where where it could get complicated is obviously if it ends up being much much closer. Um, but I don't think that's that's going to happen. I think I think it, if you look at the polls right now, and obviously things can change, but Biden's ahead anywhere between eight to twelve points. So I don't think it's going to make much of a difference. Um, I think if you know if he was ahead by sort of one to two points, 
um, or Trump was ahead by one, two points, I think then sort of um, things could take longer, but not, not where it is right now.